Okay guys, so today we're going to be reading At Home in the Coral Reef. We're going to keep working with comparing and contrasting using Venn diagrams. But before we get to that, uh, I have three words to add. You do not have to define these like you did yesterday. Um, but do, excuse me, I will define these for you, but you do need to add them into your vocabulary notebook at, under last week's words. I'm sorry, yesterday's words, sorry. So, number eight is the word polyps. P-O-L-Y-P-S. And polyps are tiny sea animals that make up the coral reefs. So the, uh, yesterday when we talked about corals, polyps are what make up that coral. Polyps, again, are tiny sea animals that make up the coral reefs. Number nine is the word tentacles. T-E-N-T-A-C-L-E-S. And tentacles are a polyps. Notice that I have apostrophe S. That means that whatever comes next is going to belong to the polyp. So a polyp's little arms that help it catch food. So this polyp that makes up the coral reef, these polyps, they have tentacles that help them to catch food. Um, and then last word, number 10, is the word planula. Planula, P-L-A-N-U-L-A. -A -N -N -A. And a planula is a baby coral polyp. So the polyps are what make up the coral. They have tentacles to get so that they can catch food, and a planula is a baby coral polyp. Okay, so let's see, that's it for vocabulary. Make sure that you have all of these written in your notebook. And then go ahead and get out your reading textbook and open to page 512. Okay, so now we're ready to read, but before that, we do have guided practice that we're doing together. So open up today's packet for Tuesday, May 5th. On the very first page is your guided practice. Tear it out. I'm telling you right now, tear it out. And then that way you can keep it in your book. Okay, because we will do the first, the top half today, and then we will do the bottom half tomorrow. So after we finish today's work, you can keep this in your book as your bookmark, and then we will keep going. Okay, so you should be on page 512, and let's go ahead and read the genre first. Genre, narrative nonfiction, is a true, oh, I'm sorry, narrative true nonfiction is a true story or account about actual persons, living things, situations, or events. So a narrative nonfiction is something that is true, it is not made up, it is researched, it is fact, but it is written in the way a story would be written. So it's not written like a textbook where they have sections and things like that, it's written as one long story. However, everything that happens in it is true. There are no, um, like there's no talking animals or anything like that. So as we read this, we won't come across any um, talking fish or anything, but um, it is written in a way that is a little bit like a story. However, everything that happens in it is true. It is researched, it is fact. Um, that is a narrative nonfiction. So as we read, we are going to answer the question, how does a coral reef change and grow? We are, also going to be, we are also going to be looking for things to compare and contrast. Some we will compare and contrast on our guided practice. Some I will just talk about um, while you think about it. So let's go ahead and read. At Home in the Coral Reef by Katie Music, illustrated by Katherine Brown Wing. Down, down, down in the tropical clear blue sea lives a beautiful coral reef. The coral reef is a wonderful home for hundreds of kind of fish 
and thousands of other animals of other kinds of creatures. The reef itself is made of zillions of tiny animals called coral polyps. Each tiny coral polyp catches food with its little arms called tentacles. The polyps share their food and live so close together that their skeletons are connected. So right now we see that our first Venn diagram is comparing soft polyps and hard polyps. Remember a Venn diagram is where we have two circles that connect. Uh, the place where they connect is where we list everything that is alike about the two objects. The places that um, do not connect are where we write what is different. Well, so far, we've read that all coral polyps catch food with their tentacles and live so close together that their skeletons are connected. So that means, since it says all of them, and since it does not designate whether they're talking about soft or hard polyps, we know that means all of them. So we just read how they are alike. First, they catch food with their tentacles, and they live so close together that their skeletons are connected. So again, we know that that is true for both hard polyps and soft polyps because it does not distinguish in that paragraph. It doesn't say soft polyps do this and hard polyps do that. It just says coral polyps, which means that it's talking about both kinds. Let's keep reading to see what the differences are. Some kinds of coral polyps make soft skeletons that sway gently back and forth in the water. These polyps have eight tentacles. So we know that that, sen that that sentence, or those two sentences right there, are probably about soft polyps, since it says, since we know there are two types of polyps, uh, let's see, coral polyps, soft polyps and hard polyps, and that was saying that some have soft skeletons. So we know that is the first thing that is different about them and that they have eight tentacles. So while both types of polyps catch food with their tentacles and their skeletons are connected, the soft polyps have soft skeletons and only eight tentacles. Let's see if we see anything else about soft, uh, soft polyps and if we find anything new about hard polyps. Other coral polyps make skeletons that are as hard as a rock. Well, we just read their skeletons are hard, so we're probably about to start talking about hard polyps. Their hard skeletons form the coral reef. A hard coral polyp has 12 or 24 or 48 or more tentacles. Together, over 50 kinds of hard coral form this reef in the Caribbean Sea. So we've come up with some things that are different about hard polyps. First. They are different from soft polyps because they have hard skeletons. And secondly, they are different because they have 12 or more tentacles. Oops. Remember, when we're making Venn diagrams, we try to match the differences. So, soft polyps have soft skeletons, while hard, po hard polyps have hard skeletons. Soft polyps have eight tentacles, while hard polyps have 12 or more. So, we try to match them across so that the differences there are the same. Everything that is different about a soft polyp, we also have something that is different about a hard polyp. Okay, let's keep reading. What are these pink things? Coral eggs. Once a year, coral polyps have babies. Eggs and sperms pop out of the polyps and float up and up to the top of the blue sea. There, there each fertilized egg becomes a baby coral called a planula. Now it is ready to search for a new home. The planula is completely covered with little hairs. It swims by waving them through the water, but it cannot swim very fast. Watch out for those hungry wrasses. So right now, I can tell that even though this story is nonfiction, I can tell that it's more narrative, which means it's telling a story. 
rather than just trying to present facts. I can tell because the very first sentence of this, um, of this uh, story starts with down, 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 in the tropical clear blue sea lives a beautiful coral reef. So that down, down, down shows me that they're trying to make it a little more interesting and more exciting to read. Whereas if it was a textbook or just trying to give facts, it wouldn't necessarily add those extra little touches. Also, the question at the beginning on the, at the beginning of page 515, what are these pink things? Well, if this was just trying to give us if this was just trying to give us information and not also written to tell a story, we probably wouldn't have that question. The author would just tell us coral eggs are pink or something like that. So there's already clues we can see that this is more told as a story to entertain as well as inform because of the choices of words that the, um, that the author uses. As we're reading, go ahead and look at these pictures. On page 514, we see the coral polyp. It's, um, we can see the little, uh, the pink and there's little tentacles that come out. And then on page 515, we can see those tiny little pink bubble looking things. Those are the planula. That's the coral eggs and the babies coming out. And then we see the fish that are trying to go after these little baby coral eggs. Okay, let's keep going. Just in time, a big wave carries the planula away to the crest or top of the coral reef. Here, the water is very shallow. Because it is so shallow, the waves break and crash into the reef. Splash, crash. The breaking waves make the water very rough. It's so rough that only a few animals can live there here. A fireworm holds on tight. A school of blue tanks darts in and out hunting for food. Crash, splash. Will this be home for the planula? No, it's too rough. The planula is swept along, riding a wave over the crest to the lagoon. So first of all, we learned on the page before that the planula can't swim very fast, but they are still able to travel over great distances. And we can see that on this page because that big wave is carrying it pretty far. Because think of if you've ever been to the beach, those waves start out kind of far back and then they move closer and closer until they break. Uh, closer to the shore. So what we see at the bottom on page 516, 516 is we see that tiny baby pink planula. So find the pink planula and there it is on the crest uh, or the top of that coral reef. We can see it being carried by the waves. And then we see all the other, um, we see the other animals that live or that live or swim in the uh, crest. And we can see these are, the, these are the animals that the planula has to protect itself from. Let's keep going. The water in the lagoon is calm. Although the, the lagoon seems peaceful, it is really very a very busy place. From top to bottom. Sorry, I don't have my glasses today. I keep forgetting them, so it's kind of hard to read. So my reading is not quite as good. At the top, a pelican gulps a pouch full of fish. At the bottom, a, string, a stingray slurps up shrimp. Many animals looking for food in the lagoon are hard to see. An emerald clingfish hides on a blade of turtle grass. Clams and crabs hide in the sand. So on page 516, we can see a picture of the lagoon. And then you can see the tiny baby planula beneath the sea star. And then you see all of these other animals that live in the lagoon, and especially you can see a few that the story talks about. Now what I want us to do really quick is we're, we're going to do this verbally, so we're not going to draw it, is we're going to compare and contrast the crest of the coral reef and the lagoon. So we're going to say how they're alike and how they're different. So really quickly, I'm going to give you a minute just to think of ways, and then I will tell you. So pause this video. Think of ways that the crest of the um, coral reef and the lagoon are alike and ways that they are different. Remember, comparing is saying how things are alike. Contrasting is saying how things are different. Okay, well, they're both alike because animals of all kinds are looking for food. And neither is really a good place for the planula to live, we've discovered. 
there's just too much going on there's too many predators um, it's too even though the lagoon is nice and calm there's really just too many predators and then on the crest it's too fast the water moves too fast and there's still predators there so both places have lots of animals looking for food and are not good places for the planula to live but it's different because the water at the crest is very rough there's lots of waves breaking and things like that and not many animals live there because the water is so rough the water in the lagoon however is calm and a lot of animals live feed and hide there because we talked about the emerald fish emerald clingfish and how it hides in that turtle grass which we can see right there okay so let's go ahead and turn the page and we will keep reading such a busy place day and night in the lagoon flash glow blink what could these lights be they twinkle like stars in the sky but they are all underwater in those little sentences right there we can see a lot of ways that show that the author is writing this as a story not only to inform but also to entertain we see things like flash glow and blink and on the last page we saw um, crash and splash. Remember, those are examples of onomatopoeia, which is a word for a sound. And usually, if you are writing just a textbook just to inform, or a news article, or something that's sole purpose is to inform, you're probably not going to use a lot of figurative language like onomatopoeia. And we also see a simile. They twinkle like stars in the sky. So it's comparing those lights that we see down in the lagoon to stars in the sky using light. If you're writing an article or something just to inform, you're not really going to use figurative language. Let's keep going. These lights are made by animals. Animals almost too small to see are twinkling. Brittle stars, brittle stars flash to scare away lobsters and crabs. Worms glow to show other worms where they are. Flashlight fish attract their food by blinking. Can the planula live here? No, it is too sandy. So again, we see, let's see, we, we um, can see a picture of the lagoon at night, and we see those, uh, those uh, animals that actually light up. The brittle star lights up to scare predators away, all different reasons too. The worm lights up to show, other, uh, to show the other worms where they are, and then the flashlight fish use their lights to attract um, food. Now that doesn't mean they have batteries in them that light up, it's just part of their biology is that they have um, bioluminescence, which you can look up, it's actually really cool um, to look at pictures of bioluminescence, it's just part of their body that actually glows. So again, we found another place that's not good for the planula to live, so let's keep going. The planula needs a rocky place. It floats along to the red mangrove trees near the shore of the lagoon. Red mangroves can grow in salty water. Their roots grow out and hang down right into the ocean. Sponges and seaweeds grow on the roots. Millions of baby fish and baby shrimps start life in the water around mangrove roots. There's lots of food for them there. Will this be home for the planula too? So again, we can see that little baby planula down by the page number on 519, and then we see the mangrove roots. Mangroves are types of trees. So we see the roots and then we see there's lots of animals that live in the mangrove uh, in the mangrove roots. We can see that there are a lot of similarities between the lagoon and the man and the shore near the mangrove trees. There both places are busy because there's lots of animals uh, there. There's a lot of food for the animals. And um, but the difference is that the lagoon is more out into the water whereas the mangrove trees are near the shore. Okay, let's turn the page. No, the water here is too shady for the planula. It's too much, there's not enough sunlight. It turns away and swims to the shallow, shallow water near the beach of the lagoon. The sunshine heats the sandy beach. The sand was, by, was made by the ocean waves. Over thousands of years, the waves have pounded the skeletons of reef animals and plants into smaller and smaller bits. Eventually, the bits formed so many grades of sand that they, were, that they covered the bottom of the lagoon and washed up on shore to make a beach. Did you ever know that? That sand is actually old, like ancient um, 
skeletons of the reef animals and also ancient pieces of plants? Now you do. Will this be home for the planula? No, it's too shallow and too hot here. So by now we realize that the purpose of this story is we are trying to figure out where planula live. So this story is giving us all kinds of information about planula told in the way that makes it interesting because it is written as a story. And we know that by the end, what we are trying to find out and the purpose, the reason that the author wrote it was to inform us about where planula live with, while entertaining us along the way. So at the top, we see near the shore, we see the mangrove trees off in the distance. So we've moved away from the mangrove, uh, the mangrove roots. And now we're near the shore. And it's still not good for the planula because it's too shallow and too hot. So yes, the planula does want some sun. That's why it's not going to live in the mangrove trees, but not this much. The planula catches a current to deeper water. Oh no, the water is dirty. The water is so dirty that the coral is dying. The dirt smothers the coral polyps and blocks the sunlight they need. Chemicals washed down the rivers from factories and farms poison the coral. In the dirty water, harmful bacteria grows over the coral and kills it. Careless divers hurt the coral too. They step on it and break it with their boat anchors. Without living coral, the fish and other animals will leave. The planula cannot live here either. So now we see a picture of this deeper, very polluted area. Why do you think the author is describing this? So far, all we've read is just facts about what these parts of the water are like. And so far, it's been very nice, just not good enough for the planula. Why is the author all of a sudden talking about this dirty area and this polluted area? Well, it's letting us know that people have an effect on the environment and where animals can live. Um, she uses words like smothers and poisons and careless to show that she thinks that we are harming these ocean creatures and that it's wrong and it's a serious problem. So, so far, not only has the author written this to inform us about where planula live and to entertain us along the way, but now it also sounds like maybe she's written it to persuade us not to do things that can cause pollution like what we see on this page and that we should care and do what we can to help um, sea creatures. Okay, so that's it for today. We will finish the story tomorrow. Go ahead and leave your, uh, sorry, your guided practice whoops, in your book right here. You can keep your spots and then we will pick back up on that tomorrow.